best I can. But um, probably the, the high point of my career was unrelated, was when I was in a studio in Boston working with Michael Johnson and Maurice Starr, who was, who was the guy behind New Kids on the Block, New Edition, all that kind of thing. And we were just hanging out on a day off at the studio and Al Green came by, the Reverend Al Green. It's like one of my all-time heroes. And he was just having a look around the studio and we were introduced and then he sat down and just sang all the old great Al Green songs like Bell, Love and Happiness, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart. And I'd been playing these songs in my bedroom when I was a teenager. And I got to plug in and sit down like you are now and just play along with them. And like Maurice played organ and Michael played drums. And that's what we did that afternoon. And that's the high point. To, to play in the same room and the same song as Al Green. That was it. And I don't know if I can ever feel that good again about music. And Safe and Sorrow is that Al Green feel, you know. And the Al Green feel is a kind of shuffle, basically. It's like a... You know? <laughs> Sorry, Al. It's like him.
album I recorded mostly in New York with uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto, who you might know from doing um, mostly soundtracks like you know Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, and and uh, The Last Emperor and things like that. Um, he was just he was my choice, I suppose, because I had a bunch of songs, but I needed a direction to take them in, you know, and mostly acoustic things that I wanted to tart up and arrange properly. I saw him playing a concert as part of the Japan Festival in London and uh, said, well, he's the guy. And I thought, well, Yuji Sakamoto is not going to want to work with us at camera, but we rang him up and he said, yeah, come next week, come to New York. The album's called Dreamland. I mean, basically because I think you know, <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of territory that I inhabit, if you like. You know, every couple of years I have to come up with 10 more dreams. That's what pop songs are. Spanish Horses, which was the uh, the top 95 single <laughs> of the album, that was um, inspired by just a, a, a trip that we, we we did through Spain and uh, just by playing concerts there and stuff. And I found a kind of bit of a spiritual home there. You know, I don't know if it's just a love of flamenco or whatever. It's a kind of cod flamenco, I think you'd call it. Um, just sort of fell in love with the, with the city of Barcelona, with the architecture, with the idea of the, the whole Catalan vibe, if you like, you know, and, and uh, it's um, it was inspired actually by a Spanish band called Kitama, who are a sort of nouveau flamenco band. Now that would pretend to be a flamenco guitarist, but that's what that's what inspired it. That's the nice thing about this job, is you get to travel, travel and meet people. It's like being in this world. You know? And then, of course, being in a rock band. You don't see much because you sort of play and often leave the next day. But for me, that's probably even better just to get a snapshot as a songwriter. Get in there, plagiarize their culture, write a song about it, and sell a million. I've lived in London now for 11 years, and uh, I, you know, I'd obviously, I suppose Scotland's my spiritual home and everything. I think when you've grown up in a place, that's what you, that's what you are, that's what you carry around with you. But what I don't have is that kind of patriotism that a lot of people seem to associate with being Scottish. I think you do what you do. You're a citizen of the world, and you do your best. So, yeah, I do have a fondness in, in coming back to, to play in Scotland, but I don't have those silly things that people expect of you. I don't rush up the road, as they say, looking for, you know, square slice and plain bread. I just don't believe in all that. I think it's nonsense, man. I think Scotland's got a bit more to offer than that. I think I am ambitious. I'm not sure what I'm striving for. I suppose, like anyone in show business, I'm, I want people to buy my records and I want to be known for that. But I don't have any game plan, really. Everyone in the music business is selling something, man. Everyone in every business is selling something. I just choose to sell, you know, like you might say, the, the sensitive singer-songwriter bit. But just because that's what I do best, you know. If I was better at, you know, uh, 
electro music and I'd be doing that and making white label 12 inches. Um, but I think you've got to have brass neck in this business and you've got to, you know, get through a lot of situations. Just try and hold on to a little bit of dignity, that's all. Every, every pop song is, is a kind of three minute dream. You know, it's a kind of, a kind of, it's all what has to be imbued with hope and, you know, disappointment, whatever, these human emotions. And my ambition for any song is that it's just shared by other people. I remember the first record we ever made was a song called Just Like Gold on Postcard Records, which was based in Glasgow. And uh, we put out this record, and like two weeks later we got a postcard from Japan. I mean, man, I'd never been out of Britain, you know, the furthest I'd been was like Manchester. And we got a postcard from Japan saying how much this woman had enjoyed the record and like she'd been playing it over and over again in her bedroom. And I couldn't believe like we could make a record in Edinburgh and, and share it with someone in, in such a faraway place. And I think that's what it is. It's like uh, postcard records is a good a good name for a record company, I think. A record's like a little postcard that you send out to someone. How are you doing? And they can write back and say I'm doing fine. Oh 